This is the second lecture in a series of lectures for the course Justice and Law. I want to pick it up where I left off last time just to give you some historical background. I am not looking to make this into a history class, but I think it's important to have some uh, reasonable understanding of how these things all came together and how they all sort of fit together. So um, I want to just take a little detour um, and look at natural law as it uh, evolved, not only into divine natural law, but also how it moved into other areas uh, of natural law, secular natural law, law of reason, to kind of put this in context a little bit further. All right, so if you look at you know, the Ten Commandments, you look at Moses, Mount Sinai, uh, Ten Laws, right, that's what they are. Um, this is one example of divine natural law, one example, because there are others. So the Bible, the Torah, uh, many people, right, uh, believe these to be sources of divine natural law. Uh, obviously because the author is said to have been inspired by a divine spirit. Some uh, you know, Christians will point to canon law of the Catholic Church, let's say. And basically this was applied by ecclesiastical courts back in Europe during the Middle Ages. Another source of divine natural law. Uh, if you look at the Protestant Reformation before that, in the 16th century, uh, you had two competing camps here, or jurisdictions, right? Secular and religious, right? Uh, you had on the one hand the emperors, kings, queens, that sort of thing, uh, governed by secular jurisdiction, and that would make sense because here they could basically um, write law and the like that they felt best benefited the people and, of course, themselves. Whereas if you look at Christians, Catholics, it was the Pope that uh, presided over you know, this religious jurisdiction. So the idea that monarchies ruled by divine right um, basically allowed the secular jurisdiction to acquire some of the authority that was given to divine natural law. In other words, if the king could get people to believe, or the queen, that it was God that really um, gave them this power, uh, then you could see that uh, you know it was a very handy tool, if you will, uh, to be able to uh, justify further your right to power and control. Uh, so basically, higher law, right, uh, would have to transcend by natural uh, sort of consequences of reason any law that was enacted by human beings through their institutions or the like. I mean, it makes perfect sense, right, that if a law is handed down from God, that that somehow should take some precedent, if you believe in God, over man-made laws. So this idea of this higher law transcending these you know, rules, laws enacted by human institutions, governments and the like, that basically uh, it would be divine law that would make the most sense as the preeminent or the single um, most effective, direct, appropriate type of law. So eventually these institutions in government became bound by the law, and this became known as the rule of law. Now, the rule of law is a, a bit dicey here because it, it embodies a whole host of ideas um, and came about basically as a consequence of a struggle, obviously between the secular and the religious powers. Uh, this goes back to before the, the American Revolution, um, which makes perfect sense as well because during the American Revolution, a lot of these concepts came to the forefront um, and informed the structure of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so, and there were a whole host of people involved in uh, thinking about this, but I'm going to focus on, um, you know, John Locke. Uh, in, in part because the U.S. Constitution, uh, in many ways, owes a debt to the Lockean sort of concepts about governance and the like. So, basically, what Locke came up with that all people are born with certain rights, right? And 
what he said were there were life, liberty, and estate. This translated into Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, I mean, in some measure, you don't want to plagiarize, right? Uh, but it comes down to the same thing, and Locke is more on target here, because what he really means here is property. Uh, you know, right to life, liberty, and property that you should gain from, you know, from your own labors. Now, these rights for Locke are, are obviously not unlimited, right? Uh, but, fundamentally, what Locke says, that they're not unlimited, but they're about the fair share earned, right, by the labor of each person. Um, you know, that gluttony, waste, are not permitted. He argued because, and this is a quote, nothing is made by God for man to spoil or destroy. Leave that aside for a second. And look at the other concepts. These rights are not unlimited. What does that mean? The right to life, liberty, and estate. These are not unlimited. In other words, there are limits that are placed on these rights. So, of course, this leads to the question, well, if there are limits placed on these rights, not only what are these limits, but how they get codified, how they get enforced. You know, what should they be? Uh, and he comes down to the idea that, well, it's only appropriate that it be applied to the fair share that's earned by the labor of each person. Now, keep this in mind. The labor. We need to define what labor is here. For example, if I own a bunch of land, and I have people work that land for themselves, but I take a piece of that of their product, what they've produced, as payment, above and beyond what the land might cost me, do I have a right to those monies, or is that gluttony? In other words, to put it in present terms, most of you are familiar with the term rent. You know, you pay rent on your apartment, that sort of thing. You rent a car. When you rent, what it really means is that it's the property or the right of another that you are using for your own purposes, and for that, you pay them a fee. Right? So if you want to rent an apartment, you know, the apartment belongs to them, but for a fee, you have a right to use it. In the sense of corporate America, uh, in a business, we refer to rents as monopoly profits. What that means is above and beyond what is necessary to charge to cover your own costs and to make a profit, a reasonable profit. Don't know how to define reasonable, um, you know, but certainly you sort of uh, have some understanding that one should not make a profit so great that that profit no longer reflects, uh, you know, what they put in and how much work or how much of that profit really should belong to them. In other words, we don't necessarily have a number, but we know that from an economic point of view, once you've covered all your costs, you're entitled to some profit because someone is you in, in the capitalist system, right? Someone has used what you've earned or what is yours, however it became yours, own labor, birthright, whatever, and you've allowed them to use it. And that means, in some sense, you, they're using up what you have. And so, by doing that, you are allowed to make a profit. Okay, we can, not, we can accept that. We don't need to go into the nitty-gritty uh, nitty of profit. But monopoly rents are an excessive amount of profit. In other words, if you look at what I need to charge to recoup my cost and make some return on that, I am charging you more than that. In a capitalist system, the way that is controlled is by having other people compete. That means if I see you're selling, you know, um, you're selling rocks, and you're making a tremendous profit on rocks, greater than, you know, the profit made almost anywhere else, I'm going to get into the business of selling rocks. And how am I going to be able to sell rocks? Well, I'm going to sell better rocks, probably. And I'm going to sell them for maybe a lower cost, above my cost again, 
But enough so the other guy that I'm competing with, people will leave that person and come buy my rocks. Okay. What happens? Someone else sees that it's still a lot of profit, and they come into the marketplace. And they buy rocks. And they sell rocks now. What do I have to do with my price and the first person into the market who's making monopoly profits? We both have to lower our price and deliver a better product. And the idea of capitalism is that at some point, through competition, the price will come down to just a fair amount of profit, because if there's no profit in it, nobody would do it. A fair amount of profit for a, the best good that can be produced. That's in a perfect capitalist world. As soon as you get law that enters this, tax law, all kinds of law, that process could be corrupted. And so you have monopolies getting these rents, meaning they can get more profit for an inferior product because no one else can compete with them. Right? And the way they do that in America is typically they do it uh, through law. That has basically been established by them, those people that own these uh, businesses and the like. All right. So what's, this, what's the importance of this? The importance is that someone is writing this law, and according to Locke, there's a point at which... It's not fair anymore. And by the way, monopoly was always seen as not fair. It was gluttonous. It was uh, corrosive to the whole system of democracy and to capitalism. And if you go back and you look at what Madison said and what Hamilton said, is that you must fight the natural propensity of human beings to monopolize. Because if they monopolize, that's the end of democracy. And so they're very adamant about this, and it makes perfect sense, because democracy is based upon what? Life, liberty, and a state. I mean, I'm not going to use the pursuit of happiness. It's so vague um, that we're going to stick with the state. And so, or property. Life, liberty, and property. So the fundamental rule that Locke's getting at is, look, you should not have liberty, you know, a right to life, liberty, and property that takes advantage of me or limits my ability to have those same things, life, liberty, and property. That would be gluttonous. In other words, if I try and control a market so much that you can't enjoy the spoils of it yourself, because I've monopolized it, that this is corrosive and you're gluttonous. Think about the current situation in America and elsewhere. I guess I can couch the argument best in terms of the 1% and 99%. Um, although it's really the, the top 147,000 people who control the vast majority of the wealth that 1% has. Putting that aside, who actually owns it, let's stick with the 1% just to keep it, so it make it a lot easier. What's happened with all this money going up to the top? It's been an erosion of the middle class because they can't prosper. Um, and obviously the lower classes suffer as well. So what's happening here? Well, from Locke's perspective, rather, it's gluttony and waste. That individual liberty must have a line beyond which you cannot go. And that line is where my exercising my liberties, right, my right to life, my property, my right to acquire property, impacts your right to do those things. Life, liberty, and property. To acquire them. Now, what you're probably thinking is, yeah, but if someone's worked really hard and has acquired those things, then what right does anyone else have to say, well, that's enough. Give it to us. Well, what we're really talking about here is not someone working really hard to acquire all these things. We're talking about someone that's working real hard to monopolize, someone that is gluttonous. They're really grabbing more than they would normally grab under normal circumstances, so they're corroding. Uh, you know, they're negatively impacting this very concept of life, liberty, and property. So think about that. When you break that down, when your rights, your liberty, and your property, because you manipulate it, ends up to be not only greater than mine, which is fine, but you're never going to have total equality. You don't want that. You know, it takes away the incentive, right, to work. But where you're capturing a market and you're grabbing things that you've not earned. So we're not talking about earning it. We're talking about not having earned it. But driving people out of the market so you could charge an exorbitant price for it. Imagine if I controlled air. Imagine if I controlled air, and everyone had to pay me a fee for breathing. Um, obviously, this strikes the very core 
of natural law, because without air you can't survive. But for the purposes of my illustrating the point, let's say I controlled all the air. Now, suppose the air was given out, because you need air, right, for life especially, liberty and property. It was doled out at a fair and reasonable price with uh, you know, a fair amount of profit on my end to cover my costs and make a little something for myself because, after all, I have worked, right? My labor needs to be rewarded, right, in some way. And that reward for my labor, whether it's intellectual or physical, would have to be profit because that's how I make my living. In other words, if you're making your living doing something, you're really making a living off of the profit structure. I don't care if it's a mom and pa shop, or you're working for somebody, or you're in your own little business of some kind. It doesn't really matter, right? Um, so what we're trying to get our minds around here is, what's gluttonous? And the line is probably reasonably placed um, when it runs in the face of natural law, which is your ability to be able to have what? Fundamentally, to be able to feed yourself, protect yourself, and shelter yourself. Let's put aside, you know, you know, uh, religion, and let's put aside, you know, reason at this point. Let's just think about that concept, right? That what's just is that I should be able to survive. Now, we could look at the survival of the fittest, right, and say, well, if you can't, if you can't keep up, you fall by the wayside. But then why do we need societies? Isn't a society formed? so that life will not be like that, that we can set a structure in place that won't leave us subject to the vagaries of, you know, existence, that somehow we want to control what happens to ourselves. And so we form societies and nations in order to come together to benefit collectively. But if someone within that structure or, or several entities within that structure are corrupting that structure, then the very reason why we form the society or the nation in the first place is being eroded. That's the gluttonous nature. You're taking so much for yourself, you're using the system to do that, that ultimately you are making it impossible for others to fairly seek their own interests. And that's the line. That's how you define gluttony. But also think about it another way. From a, a point of absolute and complete gluttony, it doesn't make sense uh, productively, for a small percentage of people to control a lot. Why? Because economies grow and money is made based upon the ability to sell and for others to purchase your goods, regardless of what they are. So if more and more goes to the top, there's less and less for those 99% uh, to have money to purchase the goods and services that the very people who monopolize them are trying to sell us. In other words, the 1% can only consume so much. And they can't keep an economy going on their own. There are only so many houses you can buy, so many boats, so many planes, um, so many servants. At some point, you need other people to begin to spend their money to keep your wealth. So actually, it's in the best interest of the 1% to actually help the 99% lead more productive lives in terms of not just their own um, you know, safety and survival and their ability to protect themselves from the elements, but in a structure like a, a government, uh, it's best for the government and those people to sort of say, okay, you know, if we're gluttonous, what's going to happen is we're going to eat out our own sustenance. Eventually, the very sources of our wealth, the people, will no longer be able to exist. And then that brings uh, rise to the question, well, what do those people do? Well, either they lay down, like my example with the air, and say, well, I can't afford the air, so I guess I'll just die, which which completely runs in the face of even the most basic natural law, or the society crumbles. Because if the society is not protecting you, the nation is not protecting you, which is the fundamental reason why you joined the club, if you will, then you have to react to that to save yourself, and typically that would be revolution. Get those that have so much that are gluttonous and basically call them to account. Uh, and that means everyone from the, you know, the government leaders right on uh, through the wealthy. So what Locke is saying here is pretty straightforward. Don't waste, you know, or gluttony and waste of individual liberty can't be allowed. You can't eat out the sustenance of others in exploring your own and expanding your own liberty, right, life, 
property. Um, it has to be there has to be some measure of fairness. There has to be a just society. However, we're going to define that later on, upon which people can build, right? Upon which people can accept uh, that this is my lot in life, and this is what I have, and I have this fairly. And basically, um, you know, the future is not lost to me. All right. So if you look at the Declaration of Independence in America, you know, it was borrowed in, you know, uh, no certain on certain terms from John Locke, you know, uh, the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, you know, all men created equal, endowed by their creator. So he's bringing in a little bit of that law as well, with certain inalienable rights, right, uh, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which we've already talked about. So the freedom of thought is an inalienable right. So we've moved off of just the right to feed yourself uh, and shelter yourself and protect yourself. Now there should be freedom of thought. Why, if you can't freely think, then what's the point of your existence? If you're here just to simply blindly follow, then you have no real um, control over your own existence. And how free can you be? And is, free imp is being free important? Yeah. Basically, uh, the argument is, you know, Jefferson, Almighty God created the mind free and manifested his supreme will that free it shall remain by making it altogether insusceptible of restraint. Um, basically, if you look at U.S. law, U.S. law basically, uh, basically um, embraces these uh, ideas. Now, there are any number of uh, cases, which I'm not going to go through, in constitutional law, where basically, um, you know, cases meaning you know, lawsuits that go to the Supreme Court, um, that sort of wrestle with this idea um, and come to some sort of understanding or make some sort of peace with it. So we move in societies more towards this secular natural law, right? Um, where basically the divine law of gods, right, is now physical law, biological, behavioral laws. Uh, you know, with the application of human reason to sort of talk about what makes the most sense and, and, and how we should structure things. Um, so this the, the school of thought, uh, secular nat uh, you know, natural law, uh, talks in terms of uh, what would be uniform, what should be uniform, fixed rules under the natural law. Uh, and we have to think about particularly human nature, you know, what then under, you know, sort of this idea through secular natural law using reason, what would be the moral and ethical norms that should be applied to do what? To accomplish the very ends that we're talking about. Life, liberty, property. So basically, this is influenced, right? The secular natural law, <coughs> excuse me, is um, supported by, you know, rational thought, rational empiricism which has a truth in the 17th and 18th century during the Enlightenment, right? The importance of observing and experimenting to arrive at reliable and de uh, demonstrable truths. It's, it's what rests the very foundation of science, right? Um, to be able to establish and to prove, not just to theorize, um, that what you're saying is, in fact, either, either true or at least, at least possible, right? Uh, so John Locke, with human beings live according to three principles, like life, liberty, and self-preservation. Uh, no government obviously exists in nature. We bring those things to life. We bring them to life because we have a uh, sense that, again, uh, they're going to protect life, liberty, and property. But if they're not going to do that, then why, why would we join and create nations? There's no point to that just to hang out together? I mean, there's no point in creating a nation or, you know, being part of one if you're not deriving some benefit from it, right? Who would do anything without benefit? You know, or certainly, who would do anything that's going to be detrimental to themselves? It, 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 it violates the fundamental natural law of human beings. You know, why would I do something that would starve me out or would, uh, you know, end my life? It... it it's contrary to the very human impulses that make us human and make us pretty much like every other animal, right? If you look at the Constitution, you know, the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments to the document, uh, 
you know, they say that the government can't take life, liberty, or property, right? And now the word property appears, right? Without due process of law. We're going to end up at due process of law and, and expand on that concept and talk about it. So I won't go too much uh, in depth now about it, but it's important to keep in mind that this idea of coming to terms with what is moral you know, and, and what is ethical is now tied to these concepts. What is moral and what is ethical? Morality, the system that's built on that, is this pursuit of life, liberty, and property. That this is the goal. And embedded in these concepts is natural law. So we move a little beyond natural law to things like um, property. Life, absolutely. You know, we have the right to survive. Liberty, not well, yes. You know, maybe a little bit more than life in terms of it being more um, beyond the necessity of just, you know, everyday existence, right? And property goes even beyond that. And so the concept that a due process will address these. So I don't want to go too much in, in depth here. Uh, but basically, it's this life, liberty, and property that defines why we join a nation. You're going to protect, if I join you, if I join your nation, you're going to protect my life, my liberties, and my right to hold property, that's a very attractive offer because you're in the collective going to defend me and protect my life. No one can take that from me. So of me being out there on my own, right? You're going to now, as a nation, come and protect that. And you're going to protect my liberty. And you're going to allow me to go about laboring and producing wealth and living a better life not just one that basically uh, is based on sustenance, you know, just to get by the next day. So there's some value in joining the nation. You come to my nation, and I'm telling you, life, liberty, and property, we're going to protect that, which implies there's going to be, uh, you know, a level playing field. Not only are we going to protect you from people outside the nation violating this, we're going to protect you from people inside the nation from doing this as well. We're going to prevent other nations from overrunning us and taking life, liberty, and property from you. And also, we're going to keep the system intact here so your fellow citizens don't do that to you. And one way they can do that to you, as Madison warned about in Hamilton, is through the creation of monopolies, where they're going to violate, eat out your liberty, your, you know, uh, your rights along those lines, and your sustenance. So, again, <clears throat> over time with the Supreme Court, these concepts have been, uh, you know, in a sense, tried, and I mean by tried, literally tried in court, um, and we've had to work out. Uh, we've had to work out exactly what those things mean, and that's why Supreme Court decisions, especially, are so important because those decisions affect us in no small way moving forward. But do not lose sight of the fundamental uh, thing in play here, right? That is life, liberty, and property. Now, if you say I don't want life, liberty, and property, I'm not interested in that then there's no sense in joining the nation. And what you said is, I don't care about my life. Imprison me. I don't care about my liberty. And I don't really need anything. Because property is not just like a house or land. It's the things you have, right? Uh, this microphone, uh, you know, lamps. Anything that I have, that I use, right, that I possess, I have a property right to. No one can just walk in and say, you know, I need some lights. We're taking all the lights from your house and we're going to use them for our house. No one has a right to do that. And the nation will protect that, those lights. So it's not just property, uh, per se. And we can get down to fundamental rights like abortion. Is there a fundamental right to live even though you're not you know, born yet? And, but I don't want to cloud uh, the fundamental ideas here with what might be very sort of emotional um, you know, considerations, you know, whether or not you should be able to take your own life or have someone help you take your own life. Um, you know, these are complicated questions. So another school of natural law that I want to just touch on is historical natural law, right? Uh, and here, it simply is nothing more than that law has to conform with well-established 
but on written customs, traditions, and experiences, right? That evolve over time. In other words, as we move towards um, you know common law and the law of reason and all of that, we first take the stop at historical natural law, because these unwritten customs, traditions, and experiences that evolve, that we've come to accept as part of life, liberty, and property, um, they play an integral role in moving us from natural law eventually to common law. You know, uh, so basically it goes back to King James. Because common law flows mostly from English law, uh, or flows from English law. When King James I, right, um, wanted to assert absolute power, right? Um, what happened? During the 17th century, right, uh, you had the case of an English jurist, right, Edward Cook. He argued that the sovereignty of the crown was limited by ancient liberties, natural law, right? Um, and those ancient liberties were of the English people. We came together, we formed this thing called England, and we have fundamental natural rights here, and the monarchy cannot do that. That this customs, these customs are immemorial. They could not be changed. We have acquired a right to them, right? And these were basically laid out in 1215, the Magna Carta. Uh, again, the Magna Carta is very important because it expresses these fundamental rights, and it's those fundamental rights, of, of common law rights, that form the, the foundation of the U.S. Constitutional, uh, the U.S. Constitution, and the liberties that are laid out there. Um, you know, the idea of you know uh, grand juries, petite juries, and the writ of habeas corpus uh, are in the Magna Carta, um, and other aspects as well of our Constitution can be found there. So it makes perfect sense. We came here. There was natural law. We know we wanted to avoid, and we had a right to a fundamental right to, which was life, liberty, right, the, the, being able to protect ourselves, shelter ourselves, uh, feed ourselves, and the like. We had a right to those things. Um, and then we got together with four nations. And we moved more towards a natural law that was secular in nature. It didn't take on the issues or uh, bring in the issues of uh, religion. It sidestepped those a bit, if you will. Now, not completely, but we're at least moving in that direction. So um, the idea here is that when you form this nation, right, and you practice certain things over and over and over again, you have a right to expect that those rights are yours. If I'm allowed every day to go into your property where I have a garden that I've put in place and take the food out of that garden and you allow it, after a while, I have a right because you haven't stopped me. You haven't said, look, I'm drawing the line here. This is unacceptable. Your rights are now infringing upon mine. What you're saying is that piece of land of mine that you're using for your garden, uh, it's not infringing on my life, my liberty, or my right to hold property. I'm okay with you doing it. So after a while, I acquire a right to it, right? Uh, and it's mine. In law, that gets codified later on as adverse possession, where basically I can come in and, and use your property, uh, and there are certain things that qualify that qualifiers there. But fundamentally, I'm walking in and taking your property, and you've allowed it, right? So common law is very important here. All right. Um, when you look at this, I don't want to walk through a long history of all of this. Um, but basically, uh, I want to talk about uh, acquittal. Uh, you know, the, Zen the Zenger really acquittal, uh, I'm sorry, acquittal uh, idea here. Uh, in other words, these ideas uh, became very, very entrenched or very, very enmeshed in U.S. US jurisprudence. Uh, the idea of acquittal gave birth to the idea that truth is a defense. Now that sounds, I know that sounds odd because it's so much a part of the mindset here, the moral structure here. But that truth basically is an absolute defense and that it should be protected. And it is, right? In the First Amendment, you can look up a New York Times versus Sullivan uh, back in 1964. That doesn't, that's not really the point here. Um, 
also uh, the power of the jury to nullify, right, uh, to acquit defendants, and where there's overwhelming evidence of guilt in order to challenge a specific law. We don't like this law, and you can see where we're moving, I think, which is towards due process as we move down here. But the idea here is a very simple one. We're not in it alone, and there's a process that protects us so that basically we have a right to defend ourselves. And for the first time, as odd as it may sound, we've moved towards, you know, the truth being a defense. Or even being found guilty of something that a jury can overturn the conviction because something is not right about the law or the way the law was exercised, right? All right, so common law becomes a very important foundation now because what's happened here, as we form the nation, the idea of it, not just America, but the idea of it, you can't possibly write out all the laws. You know, a lawyer's stock and trade are words. And words, you know, they can be interpreted in many, many different ways. It's no wonder the Supreme Court often goes to the dictionary to define exactly what a word means. Uh, or they look at the culture and see how the culture uses that word. Because it's the common language that's what's important here. What do these words mean? That's the foundation of all law. And then, of course, the court will look at Congress's debates as they discuss the law. What was their intent behind the law? But you see, they have to do all this because it's based on words. And words are very easily manipulated, right? Um, logically, uh, you can do almost anything you want. There's not a contract that can be written that, you know, you can't fudge in some way. Of course, it's up to the courts to disallow that fudging, if you will. But we finally reached the point of common law. Established laws that have grown out of natural law have expanded through custom. And that over a long period of time, we've had a right to do this, and it's now, uh, we, we've, been, we've been doing it, rather, and now we've acquired a right to do it, which makes perfect sense. If I've always been allowed to do something, why should I now not be allowed to do it? So common law uh, is built upon this idea of you know, uh, natural secular law, which is built on this idea of natural law. And you'll see that common law will eventually lead to the law of reason. But common law is where we'll pick up next time. Um, it, we're on our way towards understanding what justice is uh, and how it manifests itself in America and what justice's relationship is to the law itself. And the first article you've had to read here has, has wrestled with that idea a bit. Um, what we're hoping to do is really expand on that and give you a much better understanding of exactly what its importance is, these various structures, and why we have them, uh, and how they have now manifest themselves in an ever-evolving legal structure that seeks to address the issues of liberty, life, and property. We'll pick it up there next time.